to what you have come to expect of the show. A look at the day's news. Now, the Prime Minister was playing a home game today because he was in Canberra in front of the nation's press gallery, which, of course, is generally a friendly affair. But at the National Press Club, it's not always plain sailing for Anthony Albanese. Full credit to uh, an emailer to my dear friend Ray Hadley today who reminded him, and thus me, that uh, way back when he was a minister in the Gillard government, his appearances at the National Press Club were not exactly his own words. Remember when he ripped off that American president movie? Almost word for word. Tony Abbott is not the least bit interested in fixing anything. Bob Rumson is not the least bit interested in solving it. He's only interested in two things. He is interested in two things. Making Australians afraid of it. Making you afraid of it. And telling them who's to blame for it. And telling you who's to blame for it. Can you believe that really happened? That actually happened. An Australian politician who became Prime Minister, we elected him, well, not us, but you get my point, just ripped off a speech as directly as that, and yet his career was not ended. He's also, of course, been able to go on and tell us time and time again that he's changing politics. You see, he's a man of his word. That my word is my bond. Always been a man of my word. Even if, of course, he, he had the fingers crossed behind his back. Because, as you know, and as everyone's told you tonight, the reality was how many times did he say we're not going to do anything to the Stage 3 tax cuts? And while the lefties are obsessed with the high end of things... The whole idea was, of course, to remove a tax bracket, to get rid of things like bracket creep, so truly millions of Australians wouldn't have to worry about their extra job or extra hours. And, of course, he said that how many times? We haven't changed our position on the Stage 3 tax cuts at all. We haven't changed our position. I can confirm that we haven't changed our position. We haven't changed our position. Well, I'll make a few points. The first is that the government's position hasn't changed. They have legislated uh, we haven't changed our position. Tax cuts will happen in July and uh, we're... The same as what we're committed to? We're committed to that. Well, we haven't changed our position. We haven't changed our position on, on that issue. We haven't changed our position. Now, today, while he was not as bald-faced as quoting from an American movie, he tried to tell us that the decision was made on Tuesday, when plenty of evidence has been around, including today, spinning the changes to the tax system, that they've been planning this for a lot longer than just Tuesday. We obviously have been thinking over the summer period about how we do that. We received the Treasury advice uh, and we changed the government's position on Tuesday of this week when the Cabinet agreed to the new tax cuts. We had ERC, then we had Cabinet, then we had full Ministry, then I had full caucus. Doing the right thing, making sure that everyone had a chance to have that input. So forget the process here, right? As he was telling people this year, as he was telling people all summer, no plans to change, there was a plan to change. So on top of the broken promise, there was the blatant broken promises while they were breaking the promise. Now, I love the number of people that are turning around saying, well, this they don't have to worry about any of this, including have a look at some of the headlines that were put up in uh, protection of the Prime Minister today, suggesting that why millions of Australians should forgive the Prime Minister for his broken promise. Actively trying to say, nothing to see here, the Jedi mind trick, right? Then, of course, there was the people over at the Turnbull Times, otherwise known as The Guardian, where 90% of Australians will cheer the broken promise. And then, as you've seen on other shows, there was the excruciating garbage of watching the Prime Minister, who has been caught lying, including about the process of his lie, turning around today and saying, no, no, not a lie, not a lie, no, 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 no. They think, they, they think, honestly, you are stupid and you will fall for anything. What I did was absolutely uh, say, I have announced, uh, when we have changed our position. We changed our position on Tuesday. And now he's turning around and he's saying that one of the reasons he had to do it was because he's like one of the nurses that was responding to the COVID emergency. And just as the health crisis of the pandemic meant the governments had a responsibility 
to change economic policy through measures such as JobKeeper, the cost of living pressures facing Australians on low and middle incomes demand a better tax policy. Seriously, the spin they are throwing at you is better than any cricket you're going to be watching in the next few days. Now, of course, remember, all last year, almost every night we talked about cost of living. But the Prime Minister did nothing with the Mid-Year Economic Review. In fact, what happened with his budget last year was $1,500 was taken off 10 million workers. Now, the difference between that automatic tax return, where you would get $1,500 all at once, and what's being proposed now, and what will inevitably pass the Parliament, because who's going to vote against a tax cut... Well, that's $1,500 in one lump sum. You can take the $1,500 and then spend it on a bill. Instead, the Prime Minister has told his MPs an excellent reporting from Sherry Marks, excellent reporting in the previous hour. You've got to watch her, then watch us, watch everyone here on Sky News. You settle yourself in with Chris Kenny, go all the way through to the late debate, like so many of you do, but you've got to watch them every night. Because the detail that Sherry had, was that the spin that MPs are supposed to go back to their communities with is to say that this is the quote-unquote solution to cost of living, a solution to people's abilities to be able to pay bigger bills is for the government to have maintained that $1,500 so every time the tax return came around, you had $1,500 to spend on a bill. Instead... This bloke thinks, seriously thinks you are so stupid that the solution to cost of living is tax cuts that would barely be able to get you a family meal at KFC, let alone take the kids to the movies. Again, now we've finally got the numbers. I'll tell you what it works out per week. If you're on $45,000, it's $15.46 per week. Oh, wow. If it's $60,000, it's $22 a week, $32 a week for somebody on $80,000 and $41 a week. Oh, thank you, Prime Minister. Cost of living has now been solved. Seriously, Labor MPs are being told, keep this up on the screen, they are being told that $15, $22, $32 and $41 is a solution to cost of living. How is it a solution to cost of living? When if somebody is paying off a home loan, I'm sorry, I've got to show you the numbers again. They could be, as a result of the elbow dozen of interest rate rises, they now have to find an extra $14,000 to pay off a $500,000 loan, $21,000 on a $750,000 loan, and $29,000 on a million dollar loan. Somehow I think $15 a week $22 a week, $32 a week or $41 a week is not going to touch the sides. So let's get to the political genius that is on great display that we sadly do not appreciate. The genius of the Prime Minister and his Treasurer. The genius of all the Labor Party machine and the MPs that are going to have to go out and shovel this garbage to people as the solution to cost of living. Now, often in politics, when somebody is doing something but you can't quite work out what they're doing, people say that it's a 4D game of chess. The reality is he's not even playing one dimension of checkers. Because, you see, here's the reality. The Prime Minister is doing all of this about the Dunkley by-election and you know all of that. But I want to go forward after the Dunkley by-election to whenever we're going to have a federal election. If they hold on to Dunkley, it'll be later this year. If they don't, it'll be as far as possible into next year. But have a look at this. The Prime Minister does not have John Howard's backbench. He does not have Tony Abbott's backbench, where these people, of course, had, like, 90 seats in the Parliament. And because the polls say, majority of people say cost of living is number one issue, 84% of people say government hasn't done enough, they're now going to turn around and tell you that $15 a week is the solution to everything. You see, have a look at this. Labor has 78 seats in the Parliament after they won the Aston by-election. You need 76 to form a government, meaning for him to have a majority government, he's only got a couple of seats to lose before he's got to go begging to the Greens to remain the Prime Minister. Now, the Greens will put him in there. A couple of the Teals might as well. But the honest reality is he will not be in charge of the country. They will be. 
Well, have a look at this. I did uh, a bit of analysis today using the census information that tells us about who make up these electorates and how much they earn and what type of jobs they do. And then I had a look at the results of the 2022 election. And when the Prime Minister has that little room to move, there's a few Labor MPs who will be quite nervous that bracket creep stays at 37 cents and people have been whacked above $100,000. Have a look at this. The seat of Higgins is now in play. Now, despite the fact that it was won by only about 4,000 votes, 27%, three points above the national average, the electorate has professionals. 15% of the electorate are managers. Those people are the ones that are going to be the ones dudded by the Prime Minister's decision. Overall, the seat has 31% higher than the mean income. So this is a rich seat. It's a Labor seat. That now is in trouble. That's in Victoria. What about in Benelong, the former Prime Minister John Howard's seat? It's only won by fewer than 2,000 votes. So if 2,000 people change their mind, the seat goes back to the Libs. Now have a look at this. 13% above national average, 38% of that seat are professionals, 15% are managers, and the seat has 17% higher than the national mean income. These people are the ones he has screwed over. He's screwing over his own back bench to try to change the polls. This is not 4D chess. Also in Sydney, the seat of Higgins. This one was won by, again, uh, the best part of 4,000 votes. 27% are professionals, 15% are managers, 31% higher than the national mean income. Ben Long, my apologies, had 17%. Seriously. So the seat of Higgins is in trouble. The seat of Benelong is in trouble. The seat of Reid. Now, they won it by 10,000 votes. That should be enough of a cushion for them to be able to hold on at the next election. But when you've got 19% higher than the national mean income and you've got the best part of 50% of the electorate are professionals or managers, guess who might change their mind going into the next election? And then a seat in Western Australia, which was won only by 5,000 votes, where 44% of the seat are professionals or managers and they're 5% above the mean income. So, again, the maths. He's got 78 seats, but one, two, three, four are directly, directly in trouble compared to the tax promise that he made at the election. The reason he said there was to be no stage three tax cuts was so he could win those four seats. Without those four seats, no majority. He'd still be the Prime Minister, but he has to go cap in hand to the Greens and the Teals. So Albo's going to back himself. But if he honestly thinks somehow political gravity will not work for him, then he's not exactly following the science, dare I say, when it comes to politics. And also, what about this? One of the things he announced today was... Uh, his ongoing carry-on to make you think that the problem with cost of living isn't anything the government does with power prices, nothing the government possibly could do to bring down petrol prices by, say, trying to move on fuel taxes. No, no, it's all supermarkets. It's all the moustache-twirling billionaires that run supermarkets and the mum and dad investors in the country who have shares in Coles and Woolies. Now, the Prime Minister has already announced an inquiry into these things. That's the one that... Today I announce that the Treasurer will be directing the ACCC to conduct a 12-month price inquiry into the supermarket industry. The ACCC has significant powers and it is the best and most effective body to investigate supermarket prices. So he's already announced an inquiry. Today he announces a new inquiry, but guess what? The inquiry doesn't report back for 12 months. But also something he's doing is to reheat a very bad idea. Remember Grocery Watch? This was Kevin Rudd's solution to the cost of living, as opposed to, what, $14, $15, $25 $25 is the solution to cost of living. And part of that process was that the Australian Consumer Association, Choice, was to go around and double-check how much items were in different supermarkets around the country. You'd be able to check on a website and work out whether the one on this side of the suburb or that side of town is the cheapest place for you to go and buy a tin of Milo. Of course, it didn't work out. Technology is a little bit better than we were the best part of, what, 15 years ago. But this is Grocery Watch. 
because he's announced that the same people who ran Grocery Watch will now be given a million dollars to track grocery prices around Australia. Oh, but by the way, it's not going to be in real-time data like Rudd's promise. It's going to be they'll come back every three months and tell us what the prices are. Now, by the way, why do I know this is Grocery Watch? Because Philip Crury wrote a piece a few years ago called How Grocery Choice Was Ushered to the Grave. It reads as follows. After the election, the website concept had begun as Grocery Watch. It was a disaster. The government gave the task to the consumer watchdog choice. That's the same people they've hired to do the same thing in 2024 that they did in 2010. Choice got $13 million back then. It's a million dollars now. The government then soon realised things were out of date, so they had to get rid of it. And who was the minister who had to get rid of it? Craig Emerson, who's the bloke they've brought back to do a supermarket inquiry. See, the thing with Labor is they think there's no such thing as a bad idea, even if it's the same bad idea 10, 15 years apart. Now, if they think this is the solution to cost of living, good luck. If they think this is the way to win over... The four seats that trusted the Prime Minister when he was clearly lying and didn't even have the guts to confess he was changing his mind while they were changing their mind. Then somehow Australian politics has completely changed and for the worse.